Welcome to the KBB Review Podcast. I'm Andy Davis, and this is the final episode of our special three-part series that we've called Changemakers. It's all in association with our very good friends at Hetic, and together we're meeting people or companies that are truly forging their own path in the UK kitchen and bathroom sector. They're shaping opinions, trends, and business practices in a way that genuinely shifts the industry zeitgeist. And I'm very pleased to say that my co-host is back. We have Hetic UK Managing Director, Simeon Gabriel. Hello again. Andy, good to see you again. Very good to be here too. And this week we're meeting someone just down the road from you at Hetic, Richard Hagen from Crystal Doors in Rochdale. Now, on the surface, they're a manufacturer of vinyl wrapped doors, but under Richard's guidance, as some people already know, there's so much more than that. He's a true champion of sustainable manufacturing, and his relatively modest company over there in Rochdale has more than most shown that it is possible for anyone to genuinely have minimal impact on their environment. But it's not just that. He's such an evangelist for the subject. He's such an expert on the mechanics, the economics, the practical applications needed to achieve these things. There's nothing conceptual in what he does. It's all very practical, and he's a leading player in the business community of Greater Manchester, sharing that expertise. There's no greenwashing here either. He's such a fascinating guy to talk to Simeon what did you think oh it was a it was a really interesting meeting he's a almost obsessive about his subject and I mean that in a really good way fascinating character real personality and what he's been able to do to bring sustainability to the forefront of his business is a lesson to us all sustainability is something that's particularly close to to my heart and the heart of the the guys at the top of Hattic. So it's very much in the uh, DNA of our business. So to meet an evangelist on the subject is is really uh, a very interesting conversation to to have. I think it's great to see that anyone of any scale can have a real impact. Compared to Hattic, Crystal Doors is a small company, but it's so embedded in how they operate. It's just so interesting. I think what it shows us is that it's even more important for people to realise that a business of any size can make a difference. People just need commitment. And if they're willing to learn a little and take small actions, then they all add up to a really big effect in uh, in the whole of society. So, yeah, it's an important lesson to us all. Totally agree with that. So let's go meet Richard Hagen from Crystal Doors. So, Richard, thank you so much for inviting us here today. We have the full tour of Crystal Doors. We've seen how it all works. One question that leaps out at me straight away from just spending even an hour with you here is what's it like inside your head? <laughs> a lot of people have asked that question and, and it's fun. And I think that's the one is I'm not really grown out of childhood. It's that level of curiosity. And uh, recently, somebody from Delighty said, we're in the age of experimentation without certainty. And we've been talking about AI, we've been talking about the revolution of what's happening in the tech world. And it is those people that are willing to adapt, willing to learn, are willing to take on these new challenges for this world. Because so much of this topic is complicated. It's really, really complicated. And even for just the one bit of your of the world, which is you making vinyl outdoors, the way you describe it just completely loses me. And I'm a reasonably scientifically minded person. You've got all this going on in your head all the time. And I just worry a little bit that you have to have a mind like yours to be able to do what you've done here there's two sides of it yes it, it is very scientific and uh, i would love to have been a scientific researcher and I'm, I'm so privileged to be with so many people at universities and in sort of the political spheres of, of what's coming through the regulations but for me it's what einstein said if you can't explain to a seven-year-old you probably don't understand it yourself and that is what needs to come through is this simple messaging for people to understand that everybody becomes on board because at the moment it's putting people off because of the change in the rules, the change in the goalposts, the change in the players. England would win if we, if we, if we were playing this, this way. It's a minefield and we need to remove the minefield and start showing what is possible and how it's done. The thing that I really liked about the way that you made a complex thing simple was when you said that your mantra is people, place and planet. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Yes, we've had corporate social responsibility for a long time, for which there hasn't been much corporate social responsibility. It's been profit-focused. Then it became environmental, social, and governance, governance being the rules and regulations, environment, and the social bit, it was a bit difficult. And for me, it needs to be put in simple words. Tell me about people. What impact do we have on people? How are we supporting people? And that's people from 
within your, your own business, your customers, the community set, and further afield. The planet is obviously all the environmental impacts, and that is the complicated part. That is scientific, and even the, the scientists are discovering new things. But for me, place is about the place that we're in. It's the built environment. It's the man-made stuff. And for me, that needs to be broken down, is the big companies have, have tried to move the goalposts themselves. And for me, I want to make the playing field easy for everybody to understand the rules. So do you think that it's it's a practical thing for small businesses to actually aspire to get to net zero? Net zero, technically, again, is 95% reduction uh, and 90% reduction on score three. It's impossible. Crystal Dolls has a beautiful sign saying we'll be carbon neutral by 2022. We were. Now it's changed to net zero. It's correct. And it's, again, back to this 2050. We're moving in the right direction. The Europeans have got serious laws. Um, Americans are spending $200 billion with what they call the Inflation Reduction Act. Everybody's now serious about it at long last. They're not saying too much at the ground level, but China is making massive inroads because if they want to trade with the rest of the world, they have to be on board. And the other countries are starting to realise the impacts are real. Okay, so let's, let's get a bit of context here within our own small world of kitchens. Last time we spoke, I think it was in 2020, it was right in the middle of the first lockdown, I think. And I asked you then to mark this industry at 10, and you gave it a call. Any advance on that? Definitely. The, the woodworking industry is, is certainly picking up its feet rapidly. We've now got this sort of the metals and the steels and the rest of it, so a bit like Hetich being part of Germany. It's going to be impacted by the new regulations that start in 2025, and it's accelerated at speed. I don't think anybody can afford to be less than a six or a seven mil. And that's where we are going to see the difference. It won't be with the small companies. It'll be with the medium-sized big companies that if they don't catch up, it'll be a bit like a Nokia. We all had a Nokia phone and now Nokia don't exist. And that's where we're going to see the big boys are going to have to put the money uh, on the table and start making the changes because the rules and regulations will force them. It's sort of a shame that they need to be forced, if that makes sense. The emergency is so clear and so obvious. Lots of people like you out there who want it to happen and want to make it happen. The moment you've got to force people, the inertia takes place. Building momentum is really, really difficult. That's related back to the football again. The ball has never been on the pitch. That's been the problem. They've not set out the rules and regulations. Now there is a ball on the pitch. We've got China way ahead because of the Earth's resources that they've got to be net zero much faster. We've got the Americans who don't want to lose control of being number one in the world. We've got the Europeans, we've got Russia with too many Earth's resources. We are now competing. The competition has started. The whistle's been blown. Um, it's time to start playing hard because it's, it's those that want to prove and want to show that the better, the consumers will move very, very quickly. One of the really interesting things for me today, meeting you, is your passion for this is absolutely palpable. Yes. Do you think it's really important for a business to have a figurehead who is right at the forefront of the business beating the drum for sustainability issues in order for it really to take hold within that business? There does need to be a sustainable champion. There does need to be somebody who's passionate in the sense that they do it personally. It's not just a job role, but there can be a different person that leads the company. I think every company needs a face. The Crystal Doors with 31 employees, it still needs one person. We need the face, as in Steve Jobs did with Apple, from that day onwards, it's the personal connection. And people do have that personal connection because I'm only a tiny company. But when it gets to a monster company or even the SMEs, kitchen, bedroom, bathroom companies, there needs to be somebody who projects the brand, the image, the culture. And within that culture is there's value now in sustainability and it's profitable when you've made the early changes. The early adopters are the ones that may or may not, they're taking risk. But now it's obvious what needs to be done and what can be done. The challenge is there for the SMEs now to show that they're competing with the big boys and can gain the business. I mean, you're right, you need that figurehead to have a cultural change, right? as much as you need someone to tick the boxes and have all the certificates up on the wall. But what I find so interesting about it is that cultural change within your employer is a big part of how you change consumers' minds because all your employees are consumers. But everyone who works here is very aware of the work you've been doing. You, you talk to them about it a lot. You are imbuing them with that passion as well. So the next time they're in the supermarket or they're buying a car, or that kind of trickle effect is really important, I think. 
This is, yeah, within B Corp, it's known as your stakeholders. Uh, within the Institute of Directors, it's a better director. Everybody, all the organisations that are large, it's trickling down now that it's not what you do. It's, it's how you do it, and it's the culture of the business. And I think that is what's important, that it's the ethics of the family, it's the ethics of the small businesses, it's the ethics of the very big businesses. And the big businesses can't move quickly because they've got so many employees and so many facilities and so many engagements. The opportunity now is for the, the SMEs to really take challenge uh, and run quickly. You mentioned the phrase B Corp there. Could you just explain a bit more about what that actually means? So B Corp is, is better cooperation in its full title. And the idea is a business is to be a force for good. At the, at the moment, it was recently changed. Is The purpose of a business is to provide profits for the shareholders. Well, salt companies, the shareholders don't work there. They don't get involved. And they make more money than the employees and the business. And it's, it's, it's really not fair. And for myself, especially now I've sold it to my employees to become an employees on trust, is they're the ones that are creating the wealth. They're the ones that, yes, I might be leading it, but I'm only one person. If everyone's equally shared at the table to put something on it, then equally we should be all taking something off it, from my ethical point of view. The B Corp gives you a score, and the, the score is a minimum of 80 points, and it's going to change to, to 10 sections at the moment. It's five, and everything has to be evidenced. So it's the same as the ISO standards, and but it's, it's about that improvement. And even now the ISO standards are saying that you've got to improve Personally, we've got continual personal development, which is you've got to improve. We're not competing against the competition within the UK. We're now competing on a global level. Part of this is, as we say, it's so complicated. The, the fundamental message is a very simple one. B Corp, as an example, which is only one of the certifications that you have, just give an idea of what you actually have to do to achieve that. How do you get from not having one to having one? So for me, it's about business resilience. It's what have I done to protect myself and my employees and my community for what may happen in the future. It's preventing and understanding what changes are coming through. So for B Corp, it's really, really easy. Is There's a B Corp impact assessment. It's free. It took me about four hours to fill in all the different sections. They ask you questions, and it's like the diversity of people, the diversity of pay, and those are the ethical sides. And then when it comes like to the environmental side, it's proven that you're, you're above and you're outstanding. You've got to understand your competition to know what's average. And then how do you make yourself outstanding within your industry, within your sector? Are you outstanding? Are you leading the way? Are you average? Are you just doing the bare minimums that the legal requirements for therefore to obviously protect people and the planet? That's a really important point that an awful lot of people kind of assume that they can't take part in these things especially small and medium-sized enterprises. So what you're saying is that actually you should have a go for a start. Secondly, that probably these things are not as cost-prohibitive as many people perhaps assume. Time is the one that I hear the most often. Is, is cost-prohibitive. That's the one I, I just tell them. Beak up impact assessments is just registered. They don't ask for any credit cards, any, any money. It's free to apply. A lot of the awards, if, if they're asking for crazy amounts of money, is they don't give you the feedback. That's the difficulty with some of the awards. But to know where you are, this one's known as a baseline assessment. Understand yourself. It's this self-reflection to be able to actually go, wow, I'm doing well. And we're just looking at the metrics of profits and cash flow and get that. That's the basics. That's the fundamentals. That's like the cake. Let's put the icing on it. Let's make it a three-tier. Let's have a party. Crystal Doors enjoys itself because we're always celebrating, because we're always achieving something. We're not threatened by, oh, it's this closure, there's this, this. It's how do we repurpose ourselves to be everybody's enjoying themselves and it's a part of it. When you go out and give talks and things with the companies and businesses and business organisations and that kind of thing, what kind of feedback do you get? Because I imagine most people want to do this, but what stops them? They just don't know where to start or it just seems so complicated and they can't even get their head around it. What are the kind of questions you get asked by other businesses? Time is the biggest one. But people are paid for their hours of work and if you haven't got those hours within the working week to go from zero to a hero or to have that ability to be able to do something does require a lot of basic understanding at the beginning. And the other one is this intent and action. There's a lot of people have that intent, but when they don't have the time or they don't have those financial resources, and, and that's what I'm now trying to address is how can enable 
SMEs to show off how unique they are and how amazing they are without putting much effort in. It's not about having to meet the criteria for the big companies that they have to meet. For me, it's about all the little companies that are so unique. Just tell your story. And are you finding that this is being reflected in the in the market as well? Uh, consumers actually looking to buy products from companies that are ethical and are aiming to be as sustainable as possible. There is, but the Advertising Standards Agency last year had 3 million complaints and they say 40% of websites are greenwashing and they say another 59 are greenhushing, which means they won't say anything. The place that we need to be is all employees talk to each other and that's where good business leadership is required. And for them to say, why are they unique? What is it about them that's outstanding? And tell that story. And everybody buys into a great story. I mean, Crystal Dolls is, is the worst or the best. From crisis of literally having 28 days to close my factory down because of the biomass burner, to then being able to say, I'll show you what can be done. And then have shown other people what can be done. It's the word responsibility, isn't it? Who do people think is responsible for what? Like if I talk to kitchen and bathroom retailers, they will say, no one comes in and asks for it and asks about it. Therefore, I'm not going to talk about it. Or they say sustainability is the responsibility of the suppliers, not the retailer. You can say that. But the person who produces it realistically should be responsible that it can be broken down. And that is being addressed. So the governments and the regulations are designed for the, the large companies to be able to obviously put those rules in. For the small companies, yes, everyone can say, Richard, you've not made any impacts because you're just a single person. The whole point is I'm only accountable for myself. We're not accountable for other people. I can't change other people, but I can change myself. I know for my children, my grandchildren, whatever that might be, and, and for other people that look around, Richard is authentic. And that, to me, is what needs to be come out, is what do you want to see in this world? What is it that you want to be? If everything is just about the cheapest price, and it's about how much of a, of a party you can have, yes, go on to have a good time. But you've got to understand the impacts on other people. Obviously, from my point of view, as a representative of Hattic, I'm interested, as a supplier, what are you looking for from your suppliers? Everybody wants the cost efficiency. We don't want prices to carry on going up at the inflation that we've, we've recently had. And that's where we want to see it that is more ethically sourced, more improving the impact on the planet, to be able to say, is circular economy that's starting to come through. And it's those companies that can blend the three together, uh, less impact on the planet, better impact on people, and a product which at the same price, and that's what everyone's getting confused with, going green now can be cheap off. It's no longer, oh, that's, that's what, you know, other people. It's the product, so like the, light, the light bulb, it is a no-brainer now. It's under a year. And I'm going to say under a year to get your savings back. And it doesn't make sense to, to have old light bulbs in your house. I mean, it's really hard, isn't it? I suppose it's one of those problems that comes down to what possible difference can I make? It's to, you know, the, the effect of the individual or the effect of the SME. You know, that you, you're a fantastic case to me, a fantastic example, but then you see a tsunami on the TV or something and you just think, what possible difference can I make or what possible difference can my company make? And of course, the answer is, if everyone did it, the situation would be much better. How do you get past that impasse of what possible difference can I make? So, so for me, all I'm bothered about is is myself mm. and my employees, and I've made a difference on the bottom line. And that's the, the hard one to achieve. And to achieve it, it's about those small changes. There's not one big thing of, you know, the solar panels from Perfect Sense, fantastic. The electric cars over the years, but it was ferociously expensive at the beginning. It was about that change of culture of every employee understanding that if our quality goes down and we have to remake them, and therefore there's costs involved. It's how do we make that quality improvement, that service improvement, that product improvement, and we can do that at ground level. Those small, small changes that make an impact on me. I ain't going to be able to do anything about the tsunami. There's horrendous impacts in this world at the moment. As long as I can be who I am to myself and to be able to support the bottom line of happiness, and, and the well-being of my employees and community, and to be able to pay them way beyond the minimum wage, that's what's going to keep me feeling positive. 
then that's what we need at the moment is businesses feeling positive. Well, I've followed your journey for quite a few years now. I've always found it so interesting. If you get a company the size of Hetty, you expect them to have a policy around this stuff and to have lots of people involved in making it better, quite rightly, too. But this is such a brilliant little case study of a little factory in Rochdale that shows it can be done. And it's a very personal journey for you, too. But when we first spoke about it, you were an outlier. Do you still feel like you're an outlier? People have called me all sorts of names. You know, Maverick is is one of the polite ones. It was radical. It was revolutionary in 2015 when I started. It's now normal. It's accepted. Now it's become, with the pension companies and the big companies, if you're not doing it, you're out of business. It's it's as rough and as as hard as that. For the, the little companies, it'll just be a change of what products you can buy because it's going to go through. But for me, it's the same as Hattie's family-owned company. It's, it's that personal touch of who's talking to who and that value of two humans communicating. Let's forget all the technology and all the other things that are causing the, 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 the challenges that we have. It's still about people, and that's what's important for me. Running a company is a big responsibility. It's something that a lot of people maybe forget is the impact that you can have on other people's lives, not just the people that are working for you, but also wider than that. It's clear that that's something that is very personally important to you. Yes, and I'm now looking through Hetish's website and doing the research that I usually do to have conversations with companies. It was obvious that it's family-owned, it's passion, it's delivering it to all the employees and the customers, and given that projection of the right image, and this is where Hetich and, and Crystal does have the support to have achieved that. But the SMEs and the little kitchen companies need to give that brand image with authenticity. Don't lie about what you haven't done. Once you've done it, celebrate. I don't pledge. I deliver and then celebrate. It's a much easier way to do it. Try your best with lots of things. Don't tell everybody that I'm going to fail on 20 things because I will be. They'll only see the one that I've succeeded of. But I'll be trying my hardest to do those other 20 things as well. But it's celebrate every time you get success. So speaking of people, one of the biggest changes you've made recently is you've become an employee ownership trust. So you don't own the company anymore. 100% was sold, yes. So explain explain to me what exactly that is and why you've done it. Two reasons for doing it. When you get to 54 and you, you start to think, I've done 30 years now, <laughs> it's more than a life sentence. I'm still very much part of Crystal Doors. And their journey now. I've achieved what I want to achieve. And now it's for me to mentor them over the next 10 years or, or whatever it might be, for them to really see the benefits of owning their own company, to be able to make that change financially massively. People in rented homes compared to people who've got mortgaged homes is, is such a discrepancy after 30 years of what wealth you have. But for Crystal Doors employees now is they're on a journey that they don't just have an income. They actually have a share as a member and the profits then go back to them. So now the real incentive is obviously to make the company profitable and that means that they have to improve what they're doing every single day. And because of this transparency, it goes into a trust. So therefore, it, it's not crystal doors, we're just going to double our prices and make loads of profit. It's about that authenticity that every single employee has to try and replicate something of Richard, something of the leader. And that's where little companies would make a massive difference that your employees have to have the same passion as the owners. As in Hetich, family-owned business, that passion has definitely, through what I can see on the website, has been passed through to all the employees. They're all on board. And little companies don't take on somebody who's not part of your team. You don't want somebody that's going to drag your company down. Is There's a, there's a, a, a definite line at crystal doors. Is you're either in the door or you're out the door. And for me, it's about that family values. How does that work, though? How do you actually do it? On a day-to-day -day basis, it's tough. It really is. It, a lot of it is, is psychology. It's expectations. And when somebody starts here on the first day, they know the standards and the expectations that's required to work at Crystal Doors. Some of them don't make it. Lots of them don't make it. But if you're Dave on the factory floor there, and one day you sort of line them all up and you go, I'm going to sign the company over to you, what does that mean for him? It went straight over his head. It took a year of slowly drip feeding. And even on the day I signed 27 documents and I knew legal aid, that's it, I'm done. And they came in and went, hi boss. <laughs> it's not easy for them to realise. And then they panicked. Richard's kept us alive for 30 years and he's leaving. 
we ain't got a chance. He's got his money. We ain't got a chance. Well, I haven't got my money. They have to succeed for me to be able to extract my money from their profits. But now they've got comfortable. And that's the other thing about cultural change and about what we're talking about to do with sustainability. Don't expect that, you know, I had a rant to everybody. I gave an amazing presentation. No chase to my money. The human mind culturally needs six months to a year minimum for it to settle in. Uh, and it needs to be spoken in different ways, different languages, and they need to have that certainty. And that's where they're at now. And we're, what, six months since signing, but they've known from uh, well over a year. Where they are now is the no the position because the last bonus they got, so they're in shock of how much they got, not where they are and what's happening. But it was delivered on a piece of paper, and they realised, is that what we achieved? That's when it sunk in. They made those profits. They were thanked, saw it in real pound notes, and they went home, and that's when the real change occurred. That must be incredibly personally rewarding for you. Yes. The, the, for me, is you can have a super yacht, you can have your private jets, and I, I really don't care. And once again, is is my wealth is the people that I communicate with, my friends, and the network, uh, and, and enjoy my life incredibly, and feel very, very privileged, and don't need the toys and illusions of, of grandeur and, and for the employees to have that moment of realization that they're now important it's hugely empowering it is it is it, it's, it's a great feeling to be able to go my cup is full i can't pour any more tea into my cup tell you what there's a few more cups on the table isn't there let's fill everybody's up and that has been the turning point for our employees but it doesn't stop any other company doing the same it's not just a Christmas bonus. There's five languages of love. We're going slightly off it, but acts of service. It's not just gifts and gifts of money. And it is about quality time. And it's how the leaders and how the management team have the dialogue with everybody else, with those customers, with the suppliers, and especially with the workers. Is Do they do it because they want to do it or they're doing it because they've been paid? And that has been the, the, the turning point for Survey Crystal Doors is they don't do it for the money. They know where they belong within the factory. They're equal. They're all equal. Is Even conversations is, I might have a great idea, but I throw it out to the table, and they might throw it off the table, or they'll develop it and make it theirs, is, is the ownership of whose responsibility and whose benefit. Well, I think it's fantastic. I, I can only assume that all successful businesses get money waved out them every now and again. I'm sure you've had some offers over the years if people wanted to come in and make you part of some massive conglomerate somewhere, but you've took tea guns and, and and again that people planet profit thing, each one of those P's is just as important as the as the other one. And I think that's I think that's fantastic. Are you an optimist by your nature? You know a thousand times more than me about where we are in terms of our journey through saving the planet. Yes. You're very well informed about it. You know of the machinations of how the government works, you know the machinations of local government, you know, all the all these things. Are you optimistic that we're, that we're going to Fix it in the end. Um, if you live in the UK, please, it's an absolute dream. It's so much better than around the equator. They're going to struggle as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, that it will be unlivable and the crops won't be coming from there. The oceans are, are changing temperature and changing pH. We're in trouble. There's no two ways about that. The UK is in the right place. That's, it'll either get a lot warmer and then when a, a jet stream stops, it'll get a lot colder. But it's livable. The amount of wealth uh, within the UK nation will have enough funds to adapt. Mm. So for me, with my children and grandchildren, UK, absolutely fantastic. People are moving to Dubai and the rest of it. When that gets to 60 degrees, they're going to have to have horrendous problems. Uh, Africa is upsetting. Obviously, the other wars around the world, very, very upsetting. The businesses are now adapting. The three big players, which is Europe, America and China, are now on board and realising the worrying speed of what's happened in the last few years. And that, for me, is is what was necessary, is the early days of 1997 to Kyoto Protocol. It's, it's, it's gone on and on and on and talk and talk and talk and talk. And it's now action. Action is, is coming through in bucket loads. And, and for the 7.8 billion, it, it's, it's a tough life for three or four billion of them. But for... Certainly, Europe is picking up, but is in a very strong position in the United Kingdom. And businesses should be leading the way rather than waiting for government to take action. Absolutely. Forced them. Yeah, there's got to be push and pull, hasn't there? I think that's a big part of it. 
Well, look, Richard, thank you so much for sparing so much time with us today. It's always fascinating talking to you. It's always so interesting. You always come away emboldened and depressed in equal measure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you for, as always, setting the, setting the right example for everybody. It's such a brilliant story. It's, um, it's always great to hear. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.